Paper three of your English Literature A-level is focusing on poetry. In the first part, you're going to compare an unseen poem with one from the Poems of the Decade anthology. And in the second part, it's movement poetry. That could have meant that you were studying a particular poet in lots of detail, or on the other hand, looking at a particular time period in the development of poetry. But in our case, it's the Romantic movement. This means that there's always a hidden, implicit question behind the actual question it was being asked on the exam paper. What do these two poems tell you about the movement that you've studied? So for the romantic section of your exam paper, the real question I want you to keep in mind, whatever the question written on the paper happens to be, is what do these two poems tell us about the romantic movement, its history, politics, literary context and the lives of the artists themselves? For this part of the exam, you're not really comparing the two poems so much as using them together like a lawyer using different pieces of evidence to make your case for what the Romantic movement was really all about. This means there are specific effective ways to structure your essay to make your evidence work best for you. I'm going to give you five pointers in the remainder of this video how to structure a Romantics essay. Firstly, you need to argue very specifically what the Romantics thought about the theme that you've been given in the question. Students who zoom in on a specific aspect of the Romantic movement and how it's explored in the poems tend to produce much more engaging, perceptive analysis of the two poems, as well as saying something interesting which the examiner actually wants to read about the Romantic period. So take this example question. Explore the ways in which unhappiness is portrayed in On This Day I Complete My 36th Year by Lord Byron and in one other poem. You must relate your discussion to relevant contextual factors. Student A writes, Both Byron and Keats embraced what Keats himself referred to as negative capability in order to make intellectual and artistic sense of the chaotic social environment in Britain and Europe at the turn of the 19th century, an environment which caused both men to experience deep unhappiness. Student B, on the other hand, writes, As romantics, both Byron and Keats were interested in themes of negative capability, the sublime and artistic individuality, themes which were inspired by the historical context of their time. They use these themes in their discussion of unhappiness. With my examiner's hat on, my impression of student A is that they have a deep enough knowledge of the romantic movement to have chosen a very specific line of argument relating to both Byron and Keats about their negative capabilities. My impression of student B, on the other hand, is that they haven't really thought about the question in enough detail and have panicked, brain dumping all of the big romantic concepts they know into their first sentence. This makes a much less precise, very waffly argument. Secondly, in the question you are given one of the poems that you have to look at. For your second, please choose a different poet. Here's another example question. Explore the ways in which death is presented in The Cold Earth Slept Below by Shelley and in one other poem. Technically, you are perfectly within your rights to answer this question by discussing two Shelley poems. You could write something like, In The Cold Earth Slept Below, Shelley creates an extended metaphor of the wilderness of grief he feels at his wife Harriet's death, taking his reader by the hand and leading us through the landscape of death like Virgil, guiding Dante through the inferno deeper and deeper into a hellish environment of guilt and recrimination. By contrast, in the question, death is something that may potentially happen, the death of Shelley's hopes of finding a lover and the death of joy in the natural landscape, but is much less certain and therefore less oppressive a theme than in the first poem. This sticks to all the rubrics of the exam and makes a good argument about Shelley. But that's also this argument's limit. It doesn't give a full enough answer to that main question that you mustn't forget to address. What do these two poems tell us about the Romantic movement, its politics, history, literary context and the lives of the poets? Shelley is only one part of the movement, so Kant on his own represent all of their views. So make two very, very specific points about how each of the poets deals with the theme in the question in a Romantic way. So you'll spend at least 10 minutes of the hour that you have for this section of the exam planning a four-part argument. Let's return to student A's argument from earlier and see if we can now develop it. Let's take our evidence from Keats's Ode to a Nightingale 
as well as the Byron poem that we've been told to write about by the exam question. Everyone else will write about Ode to Melancholy, so let's mix it up a bit and show our examiner our originality. Pause the video and spend five minutes planning what you would argue in response to that question. Compare your plan to this example. I'd like you to reflect on a few points. Did you stick to the precise, narrow focus of negative capability and unhappiness? If you don't know the poems well enough at the moment, the temptation will have been to make general points about the poems. In that case, you need to return to the two poems, do a bit more revision so that your argument is as precise and focused as it needs to be. Do your two points for each poet build on each other like these examples do? That makes them sequential. They're in a sequence. And finally, have you set yourself up for difficulty writing this essay by over-claiming? The Romantics often asked questions more than they answered them. You should try to do the same in your essay. For example, was Keats's lack of spiritual fulfilment a result of the broader trend of atheistic thinking that defined the Romantic period? It would be wrong to say that Keats was an atheist. He wasn't. But you can ask the question and make the clear link to the broader social context of the time. Before we go on to point four, I recommend that you just pause, have a look at that plan, return to your own plan, and think about how else you could make those arguments sequential and specific. Tip number four, move from the big context to the small personal context for each poet. That's both in your essay and in each paragraph. Here's a third example question for you. Explore the ways in which childhood is presented in Wordsworth's Ode, Intimations of Immortality, and in one other poem. And here's a really good example paragraph beginning to answer this question. What you can see here is that the writer has moved from the big context, that is the context of the Romantic movement's interest in notions of the sublime. That's big, that's a philosophical idea that the whole movement was really interested in. So this answer moves from that to something smaller, more personal, which is Wordsworth's take on that philosophy, his pantheistic view of the universe. Then you'll see that the paragraph actually moves back to the big context, and it does this big to small transition twice. The second big contextual idea is religious, social, it's about the 19th century church. And then finally, the paragraph moves back to a really personal point about Wordsworth's view of his own religious belief. By commenting on the big context first and then moving on to the smaller, more personal context, you ensure that you are talking about the movement first and then supporting those comments with evidence from the poet's personal lives. Yes, Keats was sad and lonely, and this might explain some aspects of his poetry, but the fact he was a romantic poet in the society, culture and literary tradition that he was in explains many more important aspects of his poetry. Another example, Byron's hedonistic debauchery and incestuous relationship with his sister is fascinating, really intriguing, and would make a great meme, but the meaning of his poems goes way beyond that. Your exam requires you to explain them in the context of the whole movement. In case we forget, this is the movement poetry section of your A-level. And my fifth piece of advice to you, don't get hung up on whether to compare the two poems or not. You know that you don't get A04 marks for this essay. Assessment Objective 4 is comparison, and it only comes in to the prose paper, of course, and into the first part of this poetry exam, not the romantics part. So, unlike the poems of the decade paper, you don't need to constantly flip-flop between the two poems to get marks. However, for the sake of writing a clear essay with a single, easy-to-follow argument, you should avoid writing about the two poems completely separately. So don't write half an essay talking about Wordsworth's poem and half an essay talking about Blake's poem. Instead, begin with an introduction that makes an argument focusing on the movement. We've seen plenty of examples throughout this video. Then, in your first part, talk about the first poem, second part, the second poem. This is the sequential four-part plan that you came up with earlier. Once you've written your four paragraphs, then 
you conclude by summarising your argument about the movement. It's a simple, clear way to make sure that the two poems you've chosen, again, are providing the very best evidence to make the argument you want to make about the romantic movement.